From the galaxy's big bad taking a subtle shot at his mortal enemies, to certain mesmerizing moments not actually being what they initially seemed. It's time to dive into those glorious episode 1 elements you've probably never even noticed. Gareth here from What Culture Star Wars and here are 20 things you somehow missed in Star Wars Episode 1 The Phantom Menace. Number 20 and anything but waterfall. Despite many being quick to take aim at George Lucas for his over-reliance on CGI and digital tinkering, throughout not only this first prequel entry but the trilogy in general, there were actually more brilliant practical elements than you'd likely have ever expected here. Look no further than the inspired foundation of Naboo's Theed Waterfalls in Episode 1, with the awesome ILM digital effects artist Dean Yerk using falling salt as the basis for what appeared to be the streams of tumbling water. Now there are a few more additional elements pumped into the mix in order to nail the desired finished article, including a matte painting background, the incorporating of miniatures, some added CGI particles, and even some digital birds. But the record will always show that Naboo's mesmerizing waterfalls all started out as little more than bags of salt pouring down some black velvet curtains being draped over scaffolding. Number 19, Palpatine's subtle dig at the Jedi Code. The eventual Emperor Palpatine actually offered up one of his first teases of his long-term plan to destroy the Jedi Order during one blink and you'll miss it exchange in The Phantom Menace. At one point in Episode 1, Senator Sheev Palpatine can be heard declaring, There is no civility, only politics. And to the average Joe or Jane, this may appear as little more than a throwaway utterance. But to those who have studied the Jedi Code, this feels like much more of a pointed dig at Palp's mortal enemy. Throughout the Jedi Code's mantra, phrases such as there is no emotion, there is peace can be found, acting as a negative statement followed by a positive one. In the Jedi's eyes, at least. So was Sheev's similar yet slightly corrupted use of words here little more than a compelling coincidence? Or the first flickers of his true form of Darth Sidious starting to come to the surface within the Senate? I votes the latter. Number 18, Natalie Portman's voice was electronically lowered. As another way of differentiating between the Queen and one of her handmaidens when accompanying the Jedi on their unexpected trip to the sandy planet of Tatooine, along with deciding on a classical tone for her former persona that took inspiration from the likes of Catherine Hepburn and Lauren Bacall with a vocal coach, Natalie Portman's voice was actually lowered somewhat in post-production. This was an attempt to add a little more gravitas to Portman's Queen persona, an effect that was surprisingly missing during the film's initial trailers. So perhaps Lucas only made this vocal call fairly late in the day upon taking in said first round of teasers. Number 17, Naboo's interiors were shot in an actual palace. One film before George Lucas decided to go blue screen crazy, it turns out that a rather epic real-life location was actually used as the backdrop for some of the Royal Palace of Thebes' grand halls. Genuinely using an actual palace for Queen Amidala's own royal gaff, Lucas took his crew to Naples' Royal Palace of Cassetta for many of the Thede Palace interior shots. The Italian monument was constructed back in the 1750s and can claim the title of being the largest royal palace on the planet, and one fit for a space opera queen as it goes. Number 16, Watto was actually crippled. Watto's Toydarian race would ultimately become a consistent part of the Star Wars universe, with Toydaria popping up during the animated Clone Wars series in particular. And one of the most notable features of this alien species comes in the form of the Toydarians' reliance on using their wings to get around the place despite boasting a set of fully functioning legs. Well, in most cases. When it comes to arguably the most famous Toydarian of the lot, however, it turns out Watto was actually relying on his wings for another reason. According to the script for Episode 1, the Tatooine junk dealer and slave owner was left crippled to the point of not being able to use both legs, with one foot being longer than the other if you look very closely. Number 15, Leia's Golden Bikini Returns. It wouldn't be a prequel Star Wars adventure without a few glorious cameo appearances along the way. But before I get to those soon-to-be famous faces and family affairs, it's time to shine a light on the sneaky return of a rather iconic get-up that first reared its head during Return of the Jedi. As first sported by Princess Leia Organa herself during her time as Jabba the Hutt's prisoner in Episode 6, that golden bikini was on show once again during Jabba's Phantom Menace appearance, as his then-current slave unfortunately found herself donning the same revealing outfit fit during the Tatooine pod race. Number 14, a who's who of soon to be famous cameos. It's not too difficult to understand why absolutely every actor worth their salt was lining up for a part no matter the size in the prequel chapter of the Skywalker saga. 
So the Phantom Menace wasn't exactly lacking in the soon-to-be-famous faces category when it came to those many folks occupying the background at various points in Episode 1. The Hobbits Richard Armitage and the Wires Dominic West both acted as members of Queen Amidala's Palace Guard at various points. Sofia Coppola stepped into the Star Wars sphere as Sashay, and even eventual Oscar nominee Sally Hawkins wound up taking on the role of extra during the film's closing celebration scene. Number 13, the first time Anthony Daniels didn't physically play C-3PO. Anthony Daniels showing as C-3PO in The Phantom Menace actually acted as something of a first for the franchise. Instead of providing the physical movements for 3PO as he had done in the prior three original trilogy entries, the nature of the protocol droid's comeback meant that a puppeteer had to be responsible for his presence on set for the first time ever. It wasn't through a lack of trying on Daniel's part, mind. With the committed actor feeling somewhat disappointed over not being able to physically bring the droid to life in Episode 1, to the point of requesting a go of the puppet job by the time Episode 2 came around. Despite putting in a sizable amount of effort to nail his puppeteering moment, though, the decision was ultimately made to scrap that design in favor of going back to a plated 3PO for Attack of the Clones. Charming. Number 12, Anakin's theme subtly foreshadows Vader. Music has always been an extremely powerful tool within the Star Wars juggernaut, and in another example of using said almost always excellent themes as a way of foreshadowing certain beats that will eventually come to pass later in the Skywalker Saga day, John Williams' work in bringing a young Anakin Skywalker's musical theme to life actually brought with it a rather subtle nod towards the Chosen One's dark future. If you listen closely to Little Annie's theme throughout The Phantom Menace, you'll hear the odd cheeky rendition rendition of none other than the Imperial March nestled in the powerful tune. Another hint at what will become of the eventual Darth Vader in the closing stages of this prequel series. Number 11, the origins of a number of notable noises. Keeping with the sounds of this first episode of prequel filmmaking, it's always remarkable to learn precisely what real-world noises sit as the origin of some of the galaxy's most notable rackets. In the case of certain underwater monsters seen when Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan Kenobi attempt to make their way to Theed with Jar Jar Binks, for example, those warbles can be attributed to none other than sound designer Ben Burt's own 18-month-old daughter, with the main sound tech claiming, at one point, she had a growl in her voice when she was crying, so I recorded that and then lowered the pitch way down in the computer. Elsewhere, Bert was said to have used the cheers and roars from a San Francisco 49ers game for the spectacular crowd noise used during the Tatooine pod race, and the force field seen during the climactic duel of the faint noise also reportedly started out as little more than the sound of one of the audio supervisor's neighbor's ceiling fan. Humble beginnings and all that. Number 10, the beginning of Master Quinlan Voss. You just never know which background entity is going to eventually find themselves becoming one of the unexpected breakout stars of your blockbuster feature, eh? In the case of The Phantom Menace, that bizarre honor was held by a debuting Master Quinlan Voss, or rather the Moss Esper background extra that was simply too damn cool to ignore and wound up acting as the inspiration for the character Master Quinlan Voss would ultimately become. Seen in a fleeting shot during Jar Jar Binks and Sebulba's scrap on Tatooine, Dark Horse comic writer John Ostrander and artist Jan Duracema took the awesome look of this dreadlocked and yellow face painted being and used it as the foundation for Voss in the Legends Star Wars Republic stories. And despite not quite making it back onto the live action stage in Revenge of the Sith, Voss was name dropped in the likes of Episode 3 and the Obi Wan Kenobi series, along with rocking up in the Clone Wars animated show, too. Number 9, Darth Maul only had three lines despite his TV spot monologue. If you were one of the many giddy folks heading into a showing of The Phantom Menace for the very first time back in 1999, you'd have been forgiven for wondering where in the holy hell all of the new big bad red lightsaber wielding in the galaxy's lines all wandered off to. That's because in one rather memorable One Truth TV spot in the lead up to Episode 1's release, Darth Maul was actually responsible for a deeply unsettling monologue about how fear was his ally. Only when the time came to actually witness this friend of fear strut his stuff on the big screen, said monologue was nowhere to be seen. With Maul, voiced by Peter Serafinowicz, only actually uttering a grand total of three lines during his 8.5 minutes of menace within the feature. He also only did something else three times too. Number 8, Darth Maul barely blinks. And it turns out that Darth Maul only ever lets loose an all-important blink on three occasions in The Phantom Menace 2. Far from simply being a technique conjured up by Ray Park and George Lucas from the get-go to give the Darth Mirian Zabrak a more unsettling vibe throughout though, this barely blinking idea was born out of the physical Maul performer actually being in agony every time he was forced to blink when donning the character's signature red and yellow contact lenses. Park used this pain to fuel his character's constant refusal to break eye contact. 
Number 7. Jar Jar Binks was the first ever fully CGI supporting character. Before Ahmed Best beat out Michael Jackson for the role of Bumbling Gungan and gave his performance of Binks while sporting a foam and latex Jar Jar suit and headgear that were later be replaced by a digital version of the side character, no fully CGI personality had ever taken on a part as a key supporting role in a movie. And while many were quick to overlook the fact that they were witnessing history unfolding in front of their very eyes in The Phantom Menace, due to Binks's many slapstick shenanigans largely being rejected by fans and critics alike, Nothing will take away Best and Bink's honor of being the CGI character who walked so that the likes of Gollum and many more could run slash crawl. Number 6. QT Pod Race Spectators Were a Thing Model maker Michael Lynch managed to pull off the ultimate illusion in his attempts to forge the sort of freakishly packed crowd of pod racing supporters needed for the Phantom Space Race. Probably sensing that trying to create fully digital fans would likely be too much work, and opting to rope in thousands of extras wouldn't have exactly been cheap either. For the many epic wide shots of the capacity crowd seen just before the pod race gets underway and during it, Lynch relied on something as simple as a boatload of Q-tips. Filling out his convincing miniature of the staggering stand with a whopping 450,000 painted little tips, Lynch would then proceed to make said cotton swabs move by blowing wind up from beneath them with a fan, giving off the illusion of the crowd naturally moving along with the thrill in action. Number 5. E.T. Stops By in the Senate Queen Amidala's move for a vote of no confidence set the stage for the Star Wars arrival nobody knew they needed in their lives. Sure enough, as the camera pans around the Galactic Senate in the aftermath of Amidala's jaw-dropping statement, eagle-eyed fans were able to catch a quick glimpse of Steven Spielberg's pride and joy, E.T., or at least the alien species seen in E.T. the Extraterrestrial. With Spielberg and Lucas very much being pals in real life, this was likely nothing more than the latter's way of returning the favor to his mate. With the former unleashing a number of Star Wars Easter eggs in his Indiana Jones series in the years before The Phantom Menace. Number 4. Three Wookiees Were Forged From One Chewy It turns out that E.T.'s unexpected emergence wasn't the only compelling detail largely overlooked during this post-no-confidence Galactic Senate pipe bomb, with a much hairier gem of a cameo being far more than what meets the eye too. During the aforementioned panning around the Senate, a number of Wookiees are also seen reacting to Amidala's words. But instead of going through the hard work of forging three brand new grizzly costumes for such a fleeting showing of the towering furballs, it was decided that the OG Chewbacca suit would be used to its fullest potential. So an actor was dumped into that original Chewie costume and recorded three separate times, with each different version seeing the costume's hair changed ever so slightly. When the shots were put together, we ended up with three different Wookiees out of one suit. How's that for efficiency? Number 3. Ewan McGregor Was Forced To Don A Wig For Reshoots there must have been a few moments when Ewan McGregor was left questioning why he ever bothered committing to becoming a pivotal part of this galaxy far, far away. Away from having to utter hilariously dreadful lines about killing younglings and spending more time than anyone would prefer acting in front of a blue screen, though, arguably the most awkward part of his Star Wars experience involved the numerous god-awful wigs he was forced into during the film's reshoots. Making matters worse, on top of numerous moments of McGregor blatantly showing off anything but legit locks being difficult to unsee once you spot them, some genius decided to use one of said reshoot short hair wigged images of McGregor on promotional posters for the incoming flick. Really couldn't have found any others, could you, mate? Number 2 327 References It's pretty widely known that the number 1138 is fairly important and common in the world of Star Wars, but there is actually another number that receives a little bit of love in Episode 1. With a notable 327 popping up in the name of the Queen's J-Type 327 Nubian Royal Starship. Far from simply being a random collection of numbers though, much like 1138, 327 has popped up in Star Wars time and time again, after first appearing in Lucas's American Graffiti. The Empire Strikes Back boasted a landing platform on Bespin of the same number. Various droids and troops have also come equipped with that number over the years too. Number 1. It's got more practical effects than the OG trilogy combined. Again, contrary to what many would have you believe when it comes to the CGI-loving creator of the galaxy far, far away himself, it turns out that George Lucas wasn't actually as hell-bent on stuffing his prequel trilogy with and generally relying on digital wizardry as many would think. Now sure, The Phantom Menace and the two episodes that would follow are still weighed down by perhaps a touch more CGI than anyone was genuinely asking for heading into the entries, but it'll likely come as a shock to many to hear that the first episode of the prequels alone actually used more miniature sets and props than were forged for the entire original trilogy all those years ago. That being said, The Phantom Menace also completely blew these films out of the water on the digital front too, again coming in with more CGI than was used in those films combined. 
Yet the fact many were quick to overlook the former impressive fact when sitting down to take in episode 1 unfortunately tells the story of Lucas not quite striking the perfect balance between practical and digital over the course of a flick many understandably branded as soulless upon its debut all those years ago. And that's our list of any other Phantom Menace details that people have missed. Let us know all about them in the comments section right down below and do not forget to like, share and go and click on that subscribe button while you're there too. I've been Gareth from What Culture Star Wars. Thank you as always for clicking on this lovely video today. Hopefully I'll see your four sensitive faces very soon, but in the meantime, may the force be with you and I'll see you soon. Bye bye.